How are we doing today, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Robbie Basil Show. Hopefully, I'll keep you guys not that long here tonight. It is pretty late already, and there's been a lot going on, so let's just jump straight into it. We have the Olympics. We have Major League Baseball, and we're going to talk briefly about the NFL Hall of Fame game from yesterday. Just some quick things that I thought on. The hall, a couple of rule changes that we saw for the first time uh, last night. So... But we're not starting with that. We are starting with Olympics, and we're going to begin with men's soccer, as we typically have done for the last couple of videos. So last time we were here, we went over the group stage, and we knew what our knockout games were. And we had the United States against Morocco. We had France-Argentina, which those two off the rip are in pretty solid matchups. We have Japan, Spain, and Egypt, and Paraguay. And we're going to start with the U.S. They faced Morocco. Quick recap of that game. Morocco dominated. They deserved it. And they went out and won 4-0. U.S., I mean, we didn't send out the greatest team of all time, but yikes. U.S. Federation's in shambles. Uh, Morocco, who are probably the third best team in the competition, knock out the Americans in the quarterfinals, final score, uh, United States nil, Morocco four. We were then followed by a very interesting match between Japan and Spain. And I had a lot of faith in Japan. You know, they won, I mean, they won their group plus seven goal difference. They're playing Spain. Who knows how it's going to go? Well, Spain dominated rather predictably and went out and won 3 0 in very comfortable fashion. So, Spain will now advance into the knockout, through in the knockouts to the semifinals, where they will be meeting Morocco. And then we had the top half, which was just weird in general. And it started with Egypt against Paraguay. And I said on Tuesday, this was going to be the worst match. It wasn't the worst match. Not, I mean, it went to penalties. Only match to go to extra time, and we went to penalties. Egypt went out and won on penalties, eventually. But it was just anything that scintillating to like continue the tournament. It was not that great of a showing in the knockouts from uh, the Egyptians. They had this scored an 88th minute goal to get themselves into penalties to equalize the match. We then went to penalties, and Egypt converted all of them. Paraguay missed one, and that's pretty much it. Uh, Egypt advances, and they will be playing France. France, who's had a fifth-minute goal by Mateta. Nothing else happened. France wins and knocks out Argentina, which then sets up this glorious bracket to where we are right now. With the aforementioned French, they face off against the aforementioned Egyptians, who look terrible at this rate, Egypt's winning gold, because that's just how these things work in France. And we have, of course, the game in Marseille with Morocco against Spain. Anything can happen. The matches, I believe, are on Monday, which I don't know why they would be on a Monday, but it works for me. It should be fun. I would, have, I would pick France and Spain, but Morocco looks really, really good. So does France. So I would say the bottom tie, it could go either way. I do like France. I mean, they have the best team in the field. I would say France, and then whoever, either team, I think, can win the match on the bottom. It's it's a very balanced uh, bracket now, other than Egypt, who I think are going to get God-smacked by France, but because that's just how everything goes with the mid-teams against France. Regardless, that wasn't the only bit of insanity happening to, uh, today, as we had men's basketball. Now, we are talking the regular men's five-on-five -five basketball, which is the only one I've have had the chance to pay attention to. Some groups already finished. One group is finishing tomorrow. And we begin with Group A. And boy, have I been wrong about Group A, particularly Canada. And I feel horrible about this because Canada went out a team. I said that was going to finish in last in the group wins the group. This is how they've done it. This is all the insanity. Canada wins again. 
Canada goes out and beats Spain by three points. A beautiful game. Spain looked not great in the first half. And Canada looked good in one quarter. But Spain go out and lose again. Spain's only win being against Greece, which knocks Spain out. Spain is gone. A team that a lot of people like to advance due to, I believe, points against, maybe? Go and they go out and are eliminated. Absolute insanity. So classification points, head-to-head -head results are equal. Well, points difference, number of games point, number of game points scored. I think is what the next one. I don't know. I I don't know. Maybe it's points conceded at this point because it's goal different than it's points conceded. So Greece. Who won one game, they beat Australia, and therefore, they're moving on. Possibly, we don't know yet. Uh, Group B was not as weird, uh, from what I recall. Last time we were here, we uh, had France struggle against Japan. Well, France went out and lost to the Germans, led by Dennis Schroeder and Franz Wagner. Uh, when Benyama tried, but wasn't enough, and Brazil yeah. Well done, Brazil. A Brazilian team that looked dead in the water after the first two matches, losing to both France and Germany, put an inspiring result against Japan to good news for them. If you look at the third place table, they've made the knockouts. Sure. I mean, because the Greeks can't get past them, Brazil has made a knockouts. They made the knockouts in basketball. Good for them. I, I mean, I did. I knew Brazil wasn't bad, but I knew it was going to be hard for them. I mean, they're in a group of Germany and France. Like, how else could it go? But Brazil digs deep, has a phenomenal all-around game. They had one bad quarter. The third quarter was not very good. But they won. Good for them. And so Brazil goes to the knockouts. They have no idea who they're going to play because there's one game, two games left. It's going to be the United States in the group of the United States, Serbia, South Sudan, and Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico got eliminated because they went out and got God smacked by Serbia. The United States faces Puerto Rico in the end, which is just the United States versus the United States because I believe the United States owns like Puerto Rico or something. I don't remember. Uh, and then we have the matchup a lot of people will be watching as well. We have Serbia and South Sudan. I think that matchup will be very interesting. Particularly for South Sudan because they could still win the group somehow. Maybe. I don't think so. Uh, because they, they don't have the head-to-head. -head, so they could finish in second. Which would be a fairly respectable run by South Sudan. Who rose on the, to the occasion led by Wenyan Gabriel. And Jones, who I'm forgetting who that is. Uh, but they've had a very good run so far. I mean, South Sudan, if you look back into the matchup with the United States, one bat, two bad quarters is why South Sudan lost. South Sudan looked better for in the second half, I would believe. So they had more points in the second half. But now they have to go up against Serbian, Nikola Jokic F uh, BC, which is basketball club in this situation. Uh, well, hopefully, Gal, uh, I think they will grab a win against South Sudan. The United States is going to be up by Puerto Rico about Puerto Rico by like fifty. But men's basketball is heating up, and it will be fun to watch out for as the knockouts are nearing to be set. We have rankings here. I don't know how the rankings really work. Um, what we do know is that uh, Australia is an unseeded team in the draw. Tuesday, we'll go over the quarterfinals, because I don't know how the quarterfinals even work at this point, but here we are. Um, but men's basketball, it's been pretty fun. I've been able to watch a couple of the games. It's been pretty good, but not as good as men's and women's tennis. It's been, as I sip this water, it's like this drink, something else. It's been very interesting. And we'll start with the men's draw. So, if you remember from last time, we had a lot of interesting matchups up upcoming. 
Lorenzo Musetti, Taylor Fritz, Casper Ruud and Sarandolo, Medvedev and Nagu Ayasame, Tommy Paul possibly facing Alcaraz. We had a lot of possibly interesting matchups. And we'll start in Section 1, which was dominated by Novak Djokovic and Stefanos Tsitsipas after Tsitsipas beat Baez in do- pretty much dominant fashion, I would say. Um... Yeah, Sissipas, second set was irrelevant. He then went out in the loss to Novak, because that's just what happens. Novak advances to the semifinal. We'll talk about what happened in it said semifinal, because it happened very recently. Uh, but this draw, as I predicted, went to Novak Djokovic, and he faced the guy who I thought would be in this matchup. It's Stefano Sissipas, and Novak wins. I got a region right. Sorta. Works for me. Uh, but Section 2 is a little more interesting. We got our boy Zverev, and he went up against Lorenzo Musetti after Lorenzo Musetti beat Taylor Fritz again, because that's just how this works. Then Lorenzo Musetti, rather, un- I mean, to shock to probably no one, Lorenzo Musetti looks really competitive again, but beat Zverev to go to the semifinals against Novak, which... I think I predicted. I don't remember why I predicted for this. I think I might have predicted Musetti for this. We're going to go over all the predic- uh, the predictions at, uh, on Tuesday because well, the gold medal match, I believe, is tomorrow. So, yeah. Uh, Musetti beat Zverev. Dominant match in the, in the back end for Musetti. He broke Zverev a couple of times. Musetti goes on to win. Bottom half was really fun. Uh, Kasparud was our prime... Our prime subject. But he was beaten by the eternal disappointment in big moments. But I don't think that title fits him no more. And it's a player I've doubted for a very long time as of late. Not from the beginning of the channel. From the middle of the... From, from our, like episode... From the second major I predicted and on. I've really doubted this player. And boy has he proved me wrong. I'm very happy that he has. And that is Francis Ergul Eliasame, who went out and beat Medvedev. Listen, fair play if he beat Medvedev. But then he beats Kasper Ruud, who I predicted, I believe, to get out of this region, to advance to a semifinal. Which, for Ergul Eliasame, fair play to him, man. I mean, I knew it's been a struggle in some majors, but he's looked great in this. He, he went out and beat Medvedev. He destroyed that Martyr guy from Germany. He opened it up by being Giroud. He's had three straight set wins. He's gone on then to win in three sets against Casper Ruud, which is a very respectable result, especially going to tie break against Casper Ruud. Like, there was never a moment in the match where Argu Eliasame was dominated by the better player. So I think this could be an awakening moment for... Francis Aguilera Asame, who dominated the majority of the match, goes on to win and will be facing, and would went on to be facing, because uh, the match happened already, um, Alcaraz. You know, I wasn't a fan of this part, because let me explain why. So we had uh, Tommy Paul face Alcaraz again, and Tommy Paul was not great against Alcaraz again. It's like a repetitive theme here. Well, this is where we're going to scroll to the top of the bracket to explain what happens next. Uh, we had this match. Uh, we were up to Paul and Alcaraz. And Alcaraz went out and destroyed Tommy Paul in the first set. Second set was very competitive, but on tie breaks, he just can't beat Alcaraz, which sets up Alcaraz annihilating... A, excuse me. Uh, he destroyed Argu Asame. Uh, the golden run for the Maple Leafs was done. He'll play in the bronze medal match against Lorenzo Musetti because that's just how this works. So we all have one versus two. It's like we're back in 2012, like around that time when we had moments like this, where one will face two because that's just how this works. And it gets back to being kind of predictable. But I think this tournament, how the draw went out to everybody, I think this was kind of predictable from the get go. But it will be a great match regardless. I mean, I think we had this match very recently. I th- was this the final from Wimbledon? Wasn't this the Wimbledon final? Wasn't this just... Yeah, it was the Wimbledon final, which was won by Alcaraz. So, you're saying to me, 
Alcaraz should probably win. Alcaraz is winning this. Alcaraz is winning the gold. Go on. I mean, I mean, okay, so hear me out. I want Novak to win because it's the one thing he hasn't done yet, at least to my memory. But Alcaraz winning it would inspire the next generation of tennis players. So you're asking for a little bit of both. I think Alcaraz's forehand and the way he's able to move more on the clay would give him the advantage in this situation over Novak Djokovic. But the other thing you have to think about is Novak's experience in big moments like this, especially at the fr- at a court he's played at for so many years in the French Open at Roland Garros. So I think Alcaraz is going to win in three sets, but I would as a as a watcher or of the of the match. I would rather Novak win, personally. Um, I think Musetti will play a phenomenal match against Orguli Asame. I think that match will go back and forth, but I think Musetti is just in much better form. I think he would be the one to go on to win. I'm just going to make sure of something. Wasn't Musetti playing in the semifinals like a week, a couple weeks ago? Yeah, so Musetti played Taylor Fritz recently. I was just remembering this. And Musetti won in the quarterfinals against Taylor Fritz, and then he goes on to beat Taylor Fritz again. So I guess we found Taylor Fritz's kryptonite, and that is um, freaking Musetti, which works for me. But you're, if you really think about this tournament, we've had a lot of rematches from Wimbledon. Alcaraz, Tommy Paul, Musetti against Fritz. Like, you can't make this up. You love to see it. Our, um, but now to the women's final, because I almost forgot about the women's side. Uh, and I feel terrible about that. Because the women's side has been ever chaos. And we already had the winner of the bronze medal. But there's another player that I really doubted from the get-go. That proved me wrong again. And we'll start from the top half of the draw with Iga Zaviatek. Who has won a medal. She already won a medal. We'll explain what happened in her match today in a bit. She played Daniel Collins after Collins beat Osorio. Zviatek beat Ji Wang. Uh, Zviatek then beat uh, Daniel Collins. I believe Daniel Collins retired in the match. Uh, I, be- yeah, I believe she retired, which was unfortunate. Zviatek will go on to the semifinals. Where should we go on to phase Zhang? Because Emma Navarro can't, uh, lost. Zhang beat Kerber in a match that I thought Kerber was actually going to win somehow because Kerber looked better with Gray against Leah Fernandez and at points looked way better than Zhang in the match. But not the day for Kerber. She goes on to lose late to Zhang. So it was Zhang and Zaviatek. We'll talk about that match in a minute. In this part of the draw, the battle of the long names with Krechkova and Shmeidolova. The only reason I was thinking Shmeida Lova was going to lose, because I didn't want to say her name again, but she goes on to beat uh, Krechkova after Krechkova beat Zavitalina, Zavitalina, and the player from Slovakia, Shmeida Lova, sure, beat Palini, which, sure. It's, I mean, I did predict Krechkova to get out of this draw, but not her her group. It was won by Shmeida Lova of Slovakia. And on the bottom part of the draw... Maria Sakari rather predictably loses in a big moment again, which I hate to see. Maria Sakari is very good, but sometimes can't do it in the big moments. She loses to Kostiuk of Ukraine. Coco Golf, remember, she lost to Vekic, which set up Vekic against Kostiuk. And what an end of this match that we had with Vekic of Croatia going to the semifinals. Where did this happen? Uh, Zviatek lost unpredictably lost, and Vekic beat the unranked Shmedlova, rather predictably, to set up Quinn Y Zhang Quinn Yen Quinn Ve- is it Quinn Ven? Quinn Wen. Zhang Quinn Wen. Sure. Against Donna Vekic. Is it Vekic or Vekic? I don't know. I'm not good with the either country's names. Iga Zviatek won the bronze. Shout out to Shmedlova for as an unseated player getting a top four place in, a, in the Olympics. Shout out to her. Very respectable result, especially from an unseated player. The only unseated player to make it to the quarterfinals. Very respectable result. I think it's going to go to Vekic, which would be perfect for this. Because Vekic, like, 
Let's look at Vekic's run in the bottom half of the draw. Vekic opened with being Bronzetti, then beat Bianca Andreescu. She beat the number two seed. She's beaten the number 12. She then, uh, yeah, she beat an unseeded player, but she's going up against Zhang, who beat a lot of people's favorite in Ika Zaviatek, which was very interesting that Zaviatek even lost, which makes Zhang's win more impressive. I think Vekic is going to win in three, but don't be surprised if Zhang goes on to win this. Zhang, I doubted Zhang a lot. I touted a lot of these players a lot, to be fair. I thought Emma Navarro was going to walk Zhang, and then J Navarro lost, which cause she got walked in the third set. How ironic things can be, but here we are. Just the way things are sometimes. Uh, but once again, shout out to these players. We have Zhang and Vekic in the final tomorrow. Should be a good time. On to our next sport, Olympic golf. We and because this makes total sense, I can't find the leaderboard for this. Um, let me try one more time. But we do have a list of the of players. Um, let's see if this works now. Ah, it does. Finally. I finally found a leaderboard that works. It took me, like, all day. That's why this video is so late. Uh, but we have at Le Golf National in France. Here is your leaderboard. Xander Shoffley, who has balled out again, has gone on to be leading the tournament through the first two rounds, tied with Hideki Matsuyama and Tommy Fleetwood. Tommy Fleetwood shoots 64, 764, to be put up a very respectable start. He is in the mix. John Rahm, who I predicted to be finished very highly here this week, after his good Ryder Cup performances in performances here at this course in the past he shot is at nine under shot five under 66 he is in fourth here's a riser that i think not a lot of people expect it was thomas dietrich of belgium who i don't know if i put on this list. i don't even remember who i put for my wild cards for this list anyway which is concerning in among itself yet in, in itself but here we are guys i mean at this rate heck i mean is there's a lot I didn't write it down. Sweet. Uh, not on my phone. So it must be on my iPad. It's dead. Uh, also on this list, um, as I'm, I forgot off track, was C.T. Pan of Chinese Taipei, Tom Kim, Stefan Jager. Here's one of my underdogs, Guido Migliosi. Shoots four under 67. He's in the mix forward back. Eric Van Roy and Joaquin Neiman, who are both off to good starts, struggled a little bit today. Shoots 69 and 70, respectfully. Matt Fitzpatrick, after a terrible first round, a 2 over 73, shoots 7 under 64, a 7 under 64, to rise up 36 places into the tie for 13th with Victor Perez and Alejandro Tosti, Corey Connors, Jason Day, and Rory McIlroy. As we continue to look at the list, we see the Ludwig Aberg. He only shot 1 under 70. It's not been a good week for Aberg. So we're all the way from the bottom and work our way up. We have... Uh, Camilo Villegas, we have all of these players. Victor Hovland's the big shocker here. A 4 over 75. Not the day for Victor Hovland. Not a tournament for Victor Hovland either. Wyndham Clark, who really struggled on day one shooting 75, goes out and shoots 68. And then you see right on the op right above him is Matthias Schmidt, who shot the literal opposite, 68, then a 75. Keep going up the list, you see Shane Lowry, who's just gotten two 71s. And here is the rest of your leaderboard. Min Woo Lee, Alex Noren, Ryan Fox, all players that I've liked in the past, not for this tournament. I'm glad I didn't pick them. Colin Morikawa, A. Burke, and the players we mentioned before. So who do I think is going to win this at this point? I'm still going John Rahm. I think John I'm going. I'm going with Rahm here. I mean, it's him or Xander to me. Matsuyama looked good, but not in the second round at all. Uh, Matsuyama has shot round of the tournament. He shot 63 in the first day. Tommy Fleetwood has shot a great second round, but struggles at times closing events. I wouldn't back him. I'd back the guy who closes really well, and that's John Rom. If you want an outside winner, Thomas Dietrich, who I think is going to struggle tomorrow, I think has a good sh outside shot. I think anyone at higher than, than six at six under or higher has a chance. Or maybe even there's a wild card that could really make a run. But Guido Meliosi winning goal would be an incredible storyline for the Italian. That would be a guy who's been a mid middle of the road guy on the DP World Tour. It would be so cool to see him win gold. 
but I think it's going to be Rom, then Xander, then Fleetwood. That just sounds right at this stage of the tournament. We'll go over my full predictions uh, from that previous video uh, on Tuesday. That's our big thing for Tuesday. To continue uh, our insanity, we have Major League Baseball. We're just going to go over a quick standings update today, guys. And what are my thoughts on what is going on? Major League Baseball. We'll start with the Nat and the American League East, where the Baltimore Orioles, who lost yesterday, have been sliding. But look who's there. Oh, hi, New York Yankees. Good to see you again. Uh, they've decided to play baseball again. Good for them. They've won five in a row and are playing the Blue Jays as we are recording this video. They have been revitalized on offense, led by Jazz Chisholm. Because that just makes sense. Listen, if the Yankees had anyone to do it, if there's any player on the Yankees that was going to do it other than Aaron Judge, it probably was Chisel because of how bad he was on the Marlins this season. He's hit as many home runs as he has with the Marlins as in the first like week he's been there for the, in the few days he's been there with the Yankees because that's just perfect. Boston's still in the mix. They, have, they won yesterday, but they've been sliding a little bit. Tampa Bay, who sold and bought at the same time no one knew really what they were doing uh lost yesterday but they've been they're still in the mix only two games behind uh, the boston red sox toronto who really looking at it won the yusei kikuchi trade uh they've lost back to back and just have the worst road record in the division but the less said about them the better what i'm loving is the yankees being revived that's my favorite storyline from this because honestly the first couple of games I, I was seeing from the Yankees like a week ago, you knew they had to do something big at the deadline, and then they got Jazz Chisholm, and this team has been revived immediately. As a fan of the game, I love to see that. Because you had no idea how the Yankees were going to respond. It could have responded in 20 different ways. 62 billion ways. I don't freaking know. But what did they do? They're playing enjoyable baseball to watch. And that has led them to be tied for first in the division and have won five in a row. Which is what they needed to do. Also, shout out to them having 38 road wins, which is just absurd for this point of the season. But yeah, you do you. It's always good to see a very competitive American League East, especially at the top with Baltimore and New York. They're going to be battling it out to the end, and I can't wait to see how that continues. But it, the Yankees want to continue. They're going to have to continue to get good performances at all phases. You talk about the rotation. You see Marcus Stroman pitching tonight. There's been some hiccups in the rotation, I believe, for the Yankees as of late. The offense has been great, but can they keep it up? And can the bullpen, led by cardiac Clay Holmes, as some of my friends call him, uh, can he get back to his old form and go back to the way he was when he first joined the Yankees and go back to being that lockdown threat? I know the Yankees wanted... Uh, some fans wanted them to get Tanner Scott from the Marlins, but I think they didn't probably want to pay as much as the Padres did. We'll talk about the Padres in a minute. To the American League Central, for the today's American League Central update, the White Sox are still awful. They've lost 17 in a row. That just deserves a sigh. Uh, oh, and there's the team leading the American League Wild Card, I believe, at this stage in time. Right? Yeah. The Royals? Hold on, hold on, hold on. Yo, are we still in 2015? No. Are we sure we're in, like, the right year? Because the Royals... They weren't supposed to be good this year, right? Hell yeah, they are. They have done it. Sort of. They're going to be the ones that are going to be the team to watch out in the Central. Because the Guardians, I think, are going to keep it up. And remember, the Guardians are doing this without Shane Bieber. Imagine how much better they would be if they had Shane Bieber on their squad. Twins have been injured to hell and back, but they, I think they're still having a down season, but even by their standards. But the Kansas City Royals and the emergence of the Kansas City Royals for their play at Kauffman Stadium, 36-22 and 22 home record. That's ridiculous. But not as ridiculous as what... The Guardians have done at home and away. They've had a very complete season, and they deserve to be leading this division. They've won 7 of 10. 
Tigers are sliding, but as you would expect, they sold at the deadline. They didn't really get a lot of returners. Players in return, that would start for them. I don't believe so, at least. And because of that, they've been sliding. But that's kind of what you would expect. Tigers sold Flaherty. They could have almost sold Tarek Skubal, who I thought would have been perfect on, like, a contender. That's who I thought the Dodgers would probably go for, but they probably didn't like the price for him. But it's going to be interesting the rest of the way because I don't trust Kansas City, but I want them to make it, if that makes sense. Because Kansas City is young. They're inexperienced in some areas, led by Bobby Witt Jr., of course. But they have some experienced pieces throughout the roster that can kind of get themselves into a position of contending in the American League Central, which to me has outperformed expectations Four-fifths of this, 80% of this division has outperformed expectations. There's 20% of the division, and you can see on your screen why this division has been a little bit of a letdown in an area. 40 and a half games back in freaking August. What are we doing? Can we, like... No, I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to say fold the team because that's just wrong, but you're just questioning everything. Though the joke I heard recently was watch them not get the first pick. Which would be fitting for this horrible tanking. But back to baseball. I mean, go west to the American League West. Which, at this point last year, I was confused by the Angels who didn't trade Otani. This year, I'm amazed at the Angels because of Mike Trout getting hurt again and is out for the season again. I hate this. I hate this team even more. They've essentially killed Mike Trout. How have you done this? Listen, I, I, I think it's an art, the way that the Angels have failed. Picasso, I think, would be proud of this. Like, every sculptor, painter, or anything imaginable would be impressed by failure. And you know, a lot of people, when you see failure, they learn from it. I don't think the Angels have learned anything. They just throw money at whatever they want. Yeah, let's go sign this player and this player and Anthony Rendon and Bartolo Colon in like 2010 or whatever it was. Let's go sign this left-handed starter. Let's sign Cody Allen. Let's sign Colby Rasmus. Let's sign Chris Iannetta. Let's sign this guy. Because he certainly has to be good on my baseball team, says Artie Moreno. But then at the end of the day, oh my God, they suck. That's, uh, that's essentially what happens to every Angels player that are signed from, like, another team to here. They're just not good. Particularly starting pitching, it's not been very good. Oh, yeah, I forgot to, I almost forgot to mention uh, Josh Hamilton. Um, then we had Alex, uh, and we have Albert Pujols and much more. The fact that this team is better, early better than a team that's moving this season is absurd. Listen, Artie Moreno, please sell that team. Please. We need something to go right for the Angels. They should not be this bad. Though I'm kind of surprised they didn't sell more at the deadline. I think they could have gotten a lot in return. But I guess Artie Moreno saw them, his team is still as competitive. But to continue in this division, Oakland has not done what they saw, I thought they were going to do. And they've not totally sucked. And what I mean by not totally sucked, I meant they're not the record of the White Sox. How are the White Sox worse than them? No clue. Probably other than Mason Miller in the bullpen. Regardless of this fact, uh, the Athletics are going to finish in, finish in last. But then it will be a dogfight at the top. Headline by the Astros? I don't think anyone wanted this. I don't think really anyone wanted this. But guess what, folks? The Astros are back. Yeah, they've lost four of ten, but they've won. They only won four of their last ten. Who cares? Because the Rangers and the Mariners are doing nothing. Astros and Mariners are tied. It's going to be a dogfight to the end between all three of them. I can't. I'm not even going to pick who's going to win this division. The only thing that I'm hoping for is that no that is that the Rangers don't play at the road in any big game because they're not winning. A 23-34 home record is a train wreck. Uh, nationally, we won't be as long in this. 
Uh, it's still headlined by Philadelphia. Mets lost yesterday, but that's just the way it is sometimes. Sorry, two days ago. Uh, they're playing the Angels tonight. It'll pro- this game will pro- this video will probably be live when that game starts. Uh, the Atlanta Braves have won three in a row. Good for them. They have emerged back to the top spot in the wild card, as they should. Uh, the Nationals are still a disaster. They've lost seven of ten. They've fallen into complete mediocrity. The Marlins, the less said about the Marlins, the better. Philadelphia continues to be Philadelphia, though they have been sliding. Opening the door for the Braves. Again. I mean, is Philadelphia alive at this point? This is the kind of run they can't do if they want to win this division. You knew out of the deadline the Braves were cooking something without Ronald Acuna again. And they kind of are. Injuries and more injuries. Uh, The Atlanta Infirmary has been stockpiled, I think, with players at this point. But they still found a way to be here, which is incredible work by the Braves. They've missed some pieces, but Marcelo Zuna and your Matt Olsons, even though he's had a down year, and your bunch of other players that I'm forgetting, and the pitching staff, I guess, I don't know, uh, are why the Braves are here. Good for them. National League Central is still a mess. How are the Reds this bad? I have no idea. How are the Pirates this good this fast? No idea. But no, I think, could be back late in the season. And that is the un- the team that said they were going to sell and didn't. The Chicago Cubs are not out of this yet. Not by any means. And you want to know what I mean, chat? I don't know if you can really see it on your screen. But the Chicago Cubs, after a winning three in a row are one game back of Pittsburgh. You thinking what I'm thinking? Dark Horse Cubs run it starts now, and I am excited to see how this goes. Yes, does this team have, have play like, I don't know, how many more games is that? They would have played 108, and they would have played, they play like four more games, but I don't think they really care. I mean, it's one more, it's one less win, but they're still three games behind. It's a one-win difference between both of the teams, which is miraculous. You didn't really get to see the game games back because it's literally right here. Uh, but the Cubs are here. They're still three games behind, but one win in difference. So essentially, the middle of this division is an absolute dumpster fire, in a way, because the, the Brewers, despite them having the offense of the New York Jets of 2022, uh, led by Zach Wilson, the equivalent of that, They've still somehow still found a way to get up to 61 and 47, lead the division by six games. It's a fairly respectable run by the, by the Milwaukee Brewers, and they deserve it. But Paul Skeen's BC, Paul Skeen's baseball club with the Pittsburgh Pirates, or the Pittsburgh Paul Skeen's, uh, they have really turned it up, with it, led by Paul Skeen's. Never when I thought I would say that. But here we are. Every team is probably around the same as of late. The Cubs can't play on the road. Everyone else kind of can, but not really. Uh, And if you want to play a home game, don't go to Milwaukee. That's all I'm going to say. Finally, in the National League West, the Los Angeles Dodgers are the Los Angeles Dodgers. But rather uncomfortably, there's another team in the mix. The Padres. Now, now, I'm going to stop sharing for a minute. I'm closer. I'm closer. Gather around. I will say this. I might, I I don't know if it's official yet, but I could be very, 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 very wrong about the San Diego Padres. I'm living up to it. I can find my baseball predictions. I don't know where I put them. Uh, not here. I don't know. I made my baseball predictions and I can't find where I put them. Because the Padres have risen into second and have won 9 of 10. Insanity is on a screen now. 
Wow, wow, wow. Here they are. I had the San Diego Padres in fourth. If you swap them and where I put the Giants, you have the San Diego Padres. And they have been revived, led by incredible play on the road, and just all-around talent. And I doubted this team. I really shouldn't have. And it's making me look like a total idiot. Because look at the Padres. They've won 9 of 10. They're four games back of the Dodgers. Because no one likes that team. And here we are, ladies and gentlemen. The Padres are back. Sort of. It may be an overreaction. Because that's how things work on this channel. But a half a game up on the Diamondbacks. Who are still here. Might I, might I add. Yes, I know I talked in a little bit of a different tone. Don't worry about it. The Giants, who are the equivalent of the worst road team you'll ever see that's still in the playoff race, is right there, too. 21-33 and 33 road record. If you zoom in there, 21-33 and 33 road record is not making the playoffs. But neither are the Colorado Rockies, so I think they're going to be pretty okay with it, to be honest. Uh, the Rockies are a mess. They will eternally be a mess. They'll be in the mix of the first pick with probably like the Marlins and the whatever the hell White Sox. That's your MLB update. See you for that part back again on Tuesday. Finally, we'll, uh, because I don't want to get demonetized, we're going to try and find... Um, I can find a picture... An image of, say, um, there's like zones and whatever. I'm trying to figure this out, and I can't get it, chat. I don't know. That's a wild cut. <laughs> I can't find the new kickoff rules. Um... We're going to try and use this photo. I know it's going to be a little bit scuffed, but hear me out. Let's try it. Um, this is what it looks like. Because we cannot show a video because we'll get demonetized. But I'll explain this as best as I can. This is not even really right either, so. Um, uh, this is not right, I don't think. So essentially... All but one, I, that was kind of right, but not really. Uh, all but one, so one player, your kicker, kicks it off from, I believe, like the 35 or the 40. And then a little bit farther along we go is where the kicking team and the receiving team have like 10 or six, 7, 8, whatever many players. I think it's 8 and 8. 8 and 10 or whatever. Uh, they all line up like 10 yards from across each other. Ball is kicked. Once the ball is touched is when those players can move. So, they, they they went over the kickoff rules, they tried them out, and let me give you my thoughts on it. As much as I hate them visually, I think it's going to kind of work. Now, I can't, once again, can't play the video. Um, let me find a diagram. I like diagrams. I mean... Let's just see what the people think of this. This is one of my favorite ways, uh, the ways that people put it. It's unnatural. I agree with them, but nothing is natural in the game anymore. Really think about it here. This is what I was talking about. Move away, Ed. Jesus. Um... You'll see a couple of ads on here, but that's just the way it works sometimes. When I go to this New York Post article, this is what I meant. So let me explain it again. So there's your kicker. Right there. Um, no, we're not going to use that. Um, close this. There's your kicking team. There's your receiving team. And there are your two last players. Ball is kicked off. They can, These teams can't move until they touch the ball. And there's also zones where, if it's like in a specific area, where a touchback is, um, 
It goes out, if it carries, it goes to the 30. If it rolls in, it goes to the 20. You get the idea. Uh, It's promoting safer kick returns. Now, like I said, I think it will grow on people, but let's just keep going through this article. I I think, uh, I mean, Kevin Clark wrote it well. We're going to have to remind ourselves that we're still in this on every kickoff we see until we pass it on. It won't do. I'm sorry, but we just need to go back to touchbacks. We're still going to see a lot of touchbacks. It's going to look fake. Kevin Clark is right. It looks fake. This looks like it's in the we're looking at the wrong the wrong league in as a whole. I think after one year, stop the video playing. Uh, we don't even see ads. I think it's gonna go back to the way it was eventually. But man, it was not. I don't know. I, I just. I just was not a fan of it, you know, at the end of the day. Uh, so this is the goal of the modified kickoff is to... Okay, let's go back to the article for a minute here. Back to the article. Um, at the same time, the goal of the modified kickoff is to incentivize to, to basically get more kick returns by imposing heavy penalties on touchbacks. They go to the 30, as well as mandate on returning kicks between the goal line and 20, known as this landing zone. Uh, they have all six in the kicks in the first half for return. Game didn't even fi- game didn't even finish, which is just how bad this was. Uh, they uh, inclement weather ruined the game, which kind of sucked. But it's n- I think the kickoff rules, if I had to scale it rated on a scale of one to ten, I would give it like a four off the jump. It didn't look pretty. It got more returns, but change. I th- it kind of changed something that didn't need to be changed, and it now looks not that visually appealing. I'm interested as we go on how people are going to receive those rules. I don't think it's going to stay in the league very long, but that's just me. What do you guys think? I'm just interested to see what you guys think in the comments. Because that is where we're going to leave the end of today's episode. Hopefully some of the graphics and hopefully some of the pictures I showed. uh, And hopefully the ads didn't get in the way because I think they might have at the end. But regardless, that is the end of today's episode of the Robbie Basil Show. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you like what you see, hit the like button down below and subscribe. But for now, Robbie Basil saying good night. See you guys Tuesday. Enjoy your weekend. Goodbye, everyone.